the problem that I want to talk about with you today is the, uh, the real healthcare challenge, cancer. So let me start with a question first. So do, do you know what Cancer Awareness Month March is? The answer is on this calendar. 27 deadly cancer that are threatening us every day. This is really overwhelming when I first time saw it. And to me, cancer was in a textbook, in a research paper, in a newspaper. It feels like far away from my real life. But when the time came along, I saw, I heard more and more cancers that happened to the, my family members, my friends, and the person that I know. And two years ago, when I started at KU, I had a first postdoc student working in the lab. I was really excited. Seven months later, her father got this acute leukemia, and she had to quit the job to take care of him. And in just the last, year, last year, two of my close family members got diagnosed uh, with cancers. My uncle passed away a few months after diagnosis of uh, gallbladder, gallbladder cancer, and then my, uh, my cousin-in-law still suffering from the terrible uh, side effects from chemotherapy treating uh, his leukemia. So unfortunately, my stories and my feelings probably familiar to uh, many of you sitting in the audience. And my wife and, and I have been actively involved in local events to promoting the awareness of cancer, like this um, whisper walk for organ cancer. So we had a chance to talk to a lot of people, sharing their stories. And what we heard very often is the cancer was diagnosed at stages four, three, which is too late. So we heard a lot of those good stories, but much more sad stories. So let's take a look at the this, uh, data we got from the National Institute of Cancer. Even though we have been fighting the cancer for over four decades, we had a tremendous progress in treating the cancer, but the diagnosis of cancer still remains as uh, the way that we did last century. So in the case of lung cancer, if the cancer was diagnosed as local positions, we had a 54% uh, to extend the life beyond five years. But for the distant cancer, the, job, the rate drops down to 5%, below 5%. And then unfortunately, most of the cancer were diagnosed at the late stages. So only those 40%, about 40% 40 people I can survive for five or more years. And same happened to the ovarian cancer here. We did a really good job treating the people when they have localized disease, almost 100%. But most of them, 80% of the cancer in this case were diagnosed at a late stage. Currently, the standard paradigm was using the imaging-based technology, like CT scan and ultrasound. Right? And, but the problem is, even though we have a much better imaging equipment, much better computer, much better trained professionals, and the sizes of the tumor that we can see actually is not much improved. Even we can see those tumor, but in order to confirm this is a cancer, not benign tumor, we have to take out the remo or remove the tissue from the human body in order to perform the examinations on the microscope. And this is very invasive and very um, expensive to do and very painful for the patient. And sometimes this is even impossible because other medical conditions preventing uh, these biopsies. So another route actually is to take lipid biopsies like this. So we know actually cancer grows small, sample, uh, small cells into a large piece of tissue. And when they grow up to like one millimeter, they need to stimulate the growth of new blood vessels so that they can get enough oxygen, enough nutrient to support their growth. And it is also very important for the cancer development because they actually can send out a lot of messages to the surrounding environment so they actually can invade and expand. 
right? This, mar uh, this message is sent by the tumors are encoded in those molecules such as DNA, microRNA, and the proteins, and then also other molecules. So it sounds like this is a ter terrific way actually to perform non-invasive diagnosis for the early cancer detection. But there's a tremendous challenge in here. And we still haven't had a lot to develop a very non-invasive, very affordable methods to detect the, uh, the disease at very early, early stages. And people haven't tried so hard to answer why this is happening. And in a particular challenge is to understand how much of those biomarkers can be released by small tissues below one millimeter, for example. So obviously we cannot do experiment to measure it because this is just too small, it's beyond our capability at this stage. And then one team at the Stanford University started to actually calculate it based on their understanding of the tumor dynamics. And their results actually is striking. They use ovarian cancer as the model, and they find out the release of one particular marker, which is a CA125, you might have heard of that. Actually, the level of that particular marker is 10,000 times below the level that we can detect clinically right now. And this is a tremendous gap out there that we need to overcome before actually can we, uh, find a cure for cancer. And this is a challenge like this. It's the challenge like this that motivated me to uh, devote my career to developing something new that actually can help us understand the tumor better and eventually find a cure. So luckily we're living in an area where the science and the engineering are explosively evolve. And we've seen a lot of discovery and breakthrough in the, uh, science and engineering in the biology and medicine is no exception. So I believe it's the combination, it's the synergetic combination of a new technology and a new biology. It is what it takes to overcome the problem and solve the, uh, the question. So I'm gonna talk about what we have done in the technology innovation in this labor chip field, as well as some work that we've done to advance the understanding of new biology, for example, exosomes here. So lab on chip, or also called microfluidics, might not be familiar with to you, but we all know the incredible evolution of electronics, the semiconductor-based electronics. And the microprocessors in this cell phone actually greatly outperform the supercomputer that we built in 20 years ago. Unbelievable, this is only 20 years ago. And those supercomputers can easily occupy an entire room in a building. And now it's only on, on my hands, right? So inspired by this tremendous success of semiconductor, people are trying to shrink the lab in the chemistry and in the biology, trying to mimic the success that we had before. So we can build through the microprocessor, which is smaller, faster, and more powerful, yet cheaper. like this. So on this small devices, we can put around a lot of those channels smaller than human here, and then we can actually integrate valves, mixers, pumps, so that we can perform entire diagnostic experiment on a small device like this. So why the small volumes are helping chemistry and biology in this case? Let's think about, we used to, to do experiments, we used to do the reaction, final uh, molecules in a beaker, say with a five ounce volume there. And in the 96th place, we have a smaller volume, which is about like 10,000 times less, but microfluid devices will allow us to run much, much smaller than that, which is about one billion of the flex volume. So think about it, if you were out to find a single molecule in a beaker, basically it's basically impossible. But it's really easy when we actually go down to the small molecule small volume on the microfluid chip. And in a sense, this is like finding a needle in a, a barn filled with a haystacks compared to finding a needle in a small pack of hay. So the next question you might ask is, how we can play with a small volume? It's just too small, right? So here shows what we do. We fab those micro valves and micro uh, pumps on the chip 
And this is the one of the chip that we built for detect detection of uh, biomarkers. So you can see here, this is actually uh, a multi-layer devices. It's made of a, a transparent uh, rubbers so they can see through, and it has two layers of channels. The bottom layer channels is allow us to uh, flow the samples, flow radiation through the, uh, the device. And then top one actually is the uh, control valves, which are connected to the, uh, the source for vacuum and air pressure. We can actually put the valves in a row, so, and those valves are controlled individually by the computer. And then we can put them, act as a parasitic pump that you can buy from those mechanics stock. But in this case, we're actually pumping a nanoliter scale volume through the channel so that it can perform biological reactions instead of pumping gallons of water through the pipeline. Another important feature of this device actually is this chamber. Um, and we can uh, take advantage of this flexible uh, membrane that we integrate on the chip. So we actually can use the, uh, the vacuum to open the chamber so we can flow the liquid through the channel quickly. And then we can push down the membrane so that we can have a very, very tiny volume. In this case, we're talking about the pickle liter, which is one trillionth of the beaker that we use for the conventional chemistry reaction. And now we actually can uh, perform really sensitive detection of a lung cancer biomarker shown here, which is IGF-1R. And this is a typical immunoassay that clinical lab for, performs all the day, right? Every day. As you can see here, when we increase the sample concentration, the biomarker concentration, we can see a higher intensity of the signal so we can de detect them and determine the concentration of biomarkers. We can easily see the concentration below one picogram mil. So imagine how low this is. Think about it dissolving one, spe uh, one spoon, one teaspoon of sugar in one billion gallons of water, which is can fill like over a thousand swimming pools for Olympic Games. There's huge pools there, and we can fill over a thousand of them. And this simple device is small, but it's really powerful. It's 10 times faster. It's a thousand times more sensitive, and it needs 10 times less reagent compared to the conventional 96 well plate that it can buy from the market. And I think this is an amazing example that we actually can use the engineering to push the our limit a thousand times towards the goal that we want to achieve to cure the cancer. And now I want to switch to another example, which we're going to use, demonstrate how we can use this powerful microfluidic technology to advance biology, the exosome. The exosome actually is not new. It was discovered about 30 years ago, which are released by most of uh, the, the cells. And it was thought that those are just a garbage can or just, just a bag to get rid of unwanted cellular materials. But re only recently, people find actually cells are sending messages through those vesicles to other cells. So that becomes very interesting. This is a very exciting new biological discovery. And what they found is actually those, there's a lot of molecules you can find in those parcels. For example, studies have shown over 2,000 protein molecules carried by these amazing parcels sent by the, uh, the cells. But the problem is, those cells are tiny, about 30 to 100 nanometers. And this is a traumatic technology challenge that we need to overcome before we actually use this for diagnostic purpose. And then also we can understand their, their biology better. And this is the machine that we use in our lab for isolation of those particles. And it's huge and expensive. And then you need to spin the sample at a very high speed so we can get 100,000 G force. For comparison, Apollo, uh, Apollo 11 command capsules enter the, the atmosphere at a very high speed. And then the G force, it was experienced only about 6 G. So this is enormous force that you need to play with. And the method, even widely used, has a lot of drawbacks. For example, it's very slow, very low efficient, it pulls down a lot of impurity with the exosomes, and then finally, it needs a lot of value, uh, sample volumes, which uh, basically is a key setback for clinical analysis here. 
So we and our collaborators actually decide to take another route. And here's a more scientific presentation of the exosomes. As you can see here, there's a lot of protein expressed on the surface. And we actually can use antibody to recognize and capture those uh, molecules. So we have a very nice handle for us to grab those parcels here. And we also develop simple uh, devices to allow us to sort of streamline the whole process, which contains multiple steps. As you can see, we start with, in the first chamber, we can actually use magnetic beads coated with antibody to grab those parcels, and then we can process them in the downstream channel so that we can actually break the membrane to open, all, open the, the package to release all the molecules. And then finally, in the last chamber, we can use another beads coated with antibody to grab all those molecules, encoding the message sent by the exosomes. And here shows the one ex uh, example. And this is the uh, SEM, or the TEM image of a very thin slices of the beads. And on the edge of those uh, slices, you can see there's a lot of tiny particles. And you can see much better if you zoom in, and it's just tiny. And then we test for the patient sample as well, compared to the healthy controls. As we see for lung cancer and ovarian cancer, we capture much more of those nanoparticles compared to the healthy controls. And also we test all those protein biomarkers carried by the, uh, the exosomes. And it was successfully demonstrated of stage two ovarian cancer patients. So you know stage two is considered as early stage. And the entire analysis study is only about 5.0 hours compared to the conventional method, needing about one week to get results back. And then we only need samples about 30 to 100 microliters. Basically, it's smaller than a finger drop of blood. And we operate in a sample to answer threat. So you avoid all those human inter intervention. And this is a single non invasive very sensitive test that we have developed, and then it has the potential to change the, the paradigm of cancer diagnostics. And then as a chemist and also technologist, I think our uh, goal is actually pushed forward. We are currently uh, developing the second generation of devices. And let's make it very clear that we're still at early stage, because exosomes still under extensive study before it actually can be used for clinical applications. And this is only a first uh, demonstration of a technology. And working on this, uh, the second generation, supported by the, uh, the NIH, the National Institute of Health. And then I really want to invite your involvement, your support, because they are super important for us to push the, uh, uh, the vision to the, our goal, finding, uh, understanding the biology better and finding a cure for, for cancer. And thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.